You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to Tea Break Time Travel, where every month we look at a different archaeological object and take you on a journey into their past. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Tea Break Time Travel. I am your host, Matilda Siebrecht, and today I am savouring a new tea, actually. It was given to me last week and it's a sort of herbally, greeny, minty, lavendery one. If I list all the ingredients, it'll just take us forever, so I won't go in that. And joining me on my tea break today is Dr. Tess Mackling. And are you also on tea today? I have to admit, I'm on coffee. Oh, that's <laughs> but I love the sound of your tea. I think that sounds wonderful. <laughs> it's one of those, I mean, why have just a normal standard tea when you can have one that has 20 different ingredients in it, right? Exactly. I have a cupboard full of them. Yeah. <laughs> and are you a, a sort of hard black coffee in the morning kind of drinker or a, a latte? or? A... No, it's it's just an instant a lot of the time or, or proper coffee if I can be bothered making it. But yes, I'm, I'm quite lazy. So. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> I admit, now that we've had our second child, there are some more coffees being drunk in the uh, yes. <laughs> in the tea yes, cup. Yes, I remember it well. I am feeling your pain. Yeah, <laughs> even though neither of us drink coffee, we only have coffee yeah. for guests. But there's been a few bodies where we've gone. Should we have a coffee? Yeah, let's have a coffee. Yeah, that <laughs> will get me through sugar. today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But tea today, tea today. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And I have sort of the standard questions that I ask all my guests so that we can get to know them. And uh, of course, the first one is, how did you first get involved in, in archaeology? And we'll go into your sort of specialization a bit later, but, but in terms of sort of archaeology in general, what first piqued your interest? Yeah, I, I realised suddenly I've been doing archaeology in some form or another for 40 years, which That's makes me sound terribly Very old. experienced, wise and experienced. <laughs> Something like that, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, my mom and dad were always into history, so we did lots of museums and stuff when I was a kid, when I was very small. And then I had a wonderful primary school teacher, Mr Colgate, and he used to take us around. I lived in a little village in Sussex and he used to take us around on these little walks saying, this is where the poor house was. And there was a girl called so-and-so who lived here. And people used to walk all the way to here to go mine flint and everything. And it absolutely fascinated me. And then you do that thing that so many of us do that you get into fossils. And then when I was about 12, I wasn't actually a member of the young archaeologist club but I got hold of one of their newsletters from somewhere and there was a dig advertised in Sussex so I went off to this dig um sliced my finger on a, on a lovely flint flake oh. the first day there <laughs> ended up in the hospital with stitches oh, and, and then went back <laughs> <laughs> you played you paid the blood you know toll absolutely uh, yeah. the blood sacrifice <laughs> the scar on my finger that I have to this day and yeah from that point onwards I was just basically, I, I just loved it. I can't, I'm, I'm always someone who's like being outside. You obviously get to meet loads of people. This was back in the day when kids could go and volunteer on sites. I mean, understandably, now there are health and safety implications that we didn't really pay attention to back then, <laughs> sadly. But yeah, I started working most of my holidays, volunteering, um, went to university, UCL, got an archaeology degree, started working as a field archaeologist, went into being a prehistoric pottery specialist, then ended up in the 17th century Caribbean looking at fortifications. Oh, wow. <laughs> and now I'm back in the Iron Age looking at gold. So, oh. yeah, I've kind of always done it. It's in my blood, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious. You mentioned, so you started with pottery and then went to fortifications. Was there what linked? <laughs> how, how did you there get There is actually a link. <laughs> Strangely enough, Dr. Elaine Morris, who's a fantastic pottery specialist down in Southampton, has connections to the island of Nevis in the Caribbean and asked me, because literally I was living in London at the time, close to the British Library, if I wouldn't mind going and doing a bit of archival research for her. Uh -huh. So I said, yeah, fine. Where's Nevis? Not a clue. Little <laughs> island in the Caribbean. Oh, and it's a 17th century fortification. No, no idea about them either. <laughs> and went and did this bit of research and discovered that not only was there one fortification out in the Caribbean, but there were actually 30 oh. that nobody knew about, these little kind of coastal batteries. Hmm. And again, a bit like how I got into talks, <laughs> kind of found a research problem, thought, oh, that's really interesting, and just carried on researching it. And then hmm. someone said to me, oh, 
because we started with, with the research project out there, started going out there a couple of times a year to dig these things. And so I said, you realise you've probably got enough to do a PhD. So I ended up doing a PhD. So yes, it's, yes. I think a friend called it a mosaic archaeology career. <laughs> I think that just about well, sums it up. But I think that's fantastic. So I have recently been to a wedding and where I was the only archaeologist there. And of course, everyone's saying, you know, the, the little small talk and saying, oh, so what do you do? You know, and yes, I said, oh, well, yeah. I'm an archaeologist. And it's inevitably the whole, oh, right. So which culture do you specialize in? Or, yeah. you know, which region do you specialize in? And I mean, I'm sort of similar. I've been all over the place in all my research. And it's it, yeah, I think it's always great to hear that people are yeah. indeed jumping around because that's the whole point, right? Archaeology, I don't know, I always say at least archaeology is not a topic, it's a frame of mind because yeah. it's sort of more about how you approach a situation. Definitely. And uh, I know so many archaeologists that are similar. I mean, even ones that are working in a particular field, most people have got an interest in something else outside of work. And like you say, it all informs, you know, we get so kind of stuck in our period bunkers, don't we, of I'm a Bronze Age person or I'm a so-and-so, when none of that actually means anything. You know, they weren't walking around in the Bronze Age thinking, right, 3 p.m. on Tuesday, we're in the Iron Age, that's it now. (laughs) Abandon everything we had before. So, no, I think it's good. It's, yeah, it helps it helps us be a bit more broad, I think, if we've got lots of different interests. Mm, definitely. No, I can't agree more. Well, uh, and uh, I'll I'll talk to you about this later a bit, actually, in the in the third section, because I think that'll be uh, interesting to go into into yeah. more detail. But second question, of course, as this is tea break time travel, we are travelling back in time. But if you could travel back in time, especially as you have such a wide range of interests, where would you go and why? I would go back to the Iron Age and ah. I would go back <laughs> to a gold workshop. Uh-huh. Wherever that might be, and that would be half of it, landing up somewhere and going, oh, that's where you were making these things. Yeah, and I I would love to see who was making what, mm. how many of them there were, whether there were women involved. I'm convinced mm. there probably were women involved. Yeah, the tools they were using, particularly how they were managing to do without blow torches. That's what I would love to know, be a fly on a wall in an Iron Age gold workshop. Hmm. I admit, and we'll, we'll probably get into this later, but I have absolutely no idea how gold is worked. So I'm very curious indeed to hear yeah. uh, more <laughs> from your experience on that. And, uh, yeah. A bit more information. <laughs> but excellent. Uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, that's absolutely fair enough. I love indeed how, I've, I think I've said this on every episode, but every single guest I've said, no one's ever said like, oh, I want to go back to this coronation of this king or, you know, something like yeah. that. <laughs> we all want to know about the ordinary tiny people, hunter. don't we? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's great. Well, indeed, thank you very much for joining me on my tea break today. And before we look in today's objects, there's been some hints uh, speckled throughout so far. So you might have already guessed what we're looking at. But let us first journey back to the first century BC, to the northwest coast of Norfolk, in the east of what we now call England. It's a beautiful sunny day, the low scrub and the marshes of the field merging into the distance into the dunes and the sandy shore. Out in the field, the wind carries the scent of the sea, rustling the long grasses, but here, in the shade of the trees, it is sheltered. Only the smallest breeze moves the hair of the man standing in the clearing. He's richly dressed, a finely woven tunic and trousers held together with a belt, metal glinting at his wrists and neck. In his hands, however, is the brightest glint of all, as the sunlight reflects off the golden surface of what appears at first sight to be a thick, twisted ring – As he lowers the item towards a hole dug deep into the ground, we see that it's not actually a complete ring, it has an opening, marked by two hollowed circles decorated with intricate detail. And that is what we are looking at today, which is the TORC, spelt (laughs) T-O-R-C. And uh, we'll get into the details soon, but first, I always like to have a look to see what the majority of the world wants to know about talks. Um, so the most asked questions on the internet, courtesy of Google search autocomplete. Uh, so first question, fairly simple. Uh, what is a talk? And it was, it was talk necklace and talk bracelet both came up. So I'm curious, in fact, what does a talk represent? Is it a necklace or a bracelet? Right. I think it's both. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I mean, the word talk comes from twist as in, you know, talk twist. So generally, if we're talking about talks, we're talking about twisted wires, a bit like the Snettersham Great Talk, if anyone knows what that looks like. If you Google it, you'll get a picture. Mm -hmm. But more generally, within Britain, they tend to be twisted wires. 
Whereas if you're looking in Europe, you've got a number of different designs. So you actually have some that are have these locking mechanisms. So they look like a complete circle. They don't mm. have the gap in the front. Okay. And they actually have sections with a like a mortise and tenon joint on it mm-hmm. that click out and then click back in. Mm-hmm. They come in all kinds of sizes. You do get ones that kind of have a 10 centimeter diameter so they're potentially arm rings or they could be for children. Mm. You also get some, there's an incredible one from Germany called the Trichtingen. I think it's Germany. I'm panicking now. It might be Switzerland, but anyway, <laughs> it's <Central> enormous. <laughs> this thing is like kilograms of silver wow. with these bull's heads at the end and the bull's heads terminals touch. Mm-hmm. And there's no way you could have got this mm. <laughs> necklace on. They've also got the Romans talk about them being put on statues. Okay. So are they symbolic? Are they worn? I mean, some of them are definitely worn because we've actually got the Newark talk, which is another one, is actually worn on the bases of the terminals. So it's obviously been on something, whether that's a mm. statue or a person. But yeah, it's it, complicated things. <laughs> <laughs> well, and indeed, that that sort of answers our next question, which was who wore talk. So I guess we don't know is the answer. Uh, no, okay. we don't. <laughs> I mean, there's there's potential that they were only occasionally worn, but may have been carried in cemeteries in in cemeteries ceremonies. <laughs> I mean, you see. In later, towards the Roman period, you suddenly see a lot of iconography that has people holding talks. Mm-hmm. And you think of the Gundestrup cauldron on one of the panels, there's Corinus holding a talk up. Mm. So whether they are partly to be worn, partly symbolic. I mean, I always think of them a bit like mayor's necklaces, mm. mm-hmm. that maybe when they're not being worn, they're displayed or revered or we don't know, I think is the short answer. Okay, okay. I mean, that seems to be the most standard answer in archaeology in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we can get close to some ideas. Short answer. You know, that, that's the thing, isn't it? So often people want definitive answers mm-hmm. and there aren't definitive answers about the past because, you know, like you say, we can't time travel back to yeah, unfortunately <laughs> see don't. what they were actually doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that also then answers the next question, which is why people, why do people wear talks? So yeah, uh, again, we don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, again, are they individual? Are they symbolic of a group? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing some work at the moment on the Snetisham Talks, which is the biggest hoard we've got in the UK. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think it's probably the biggest hoard we've got full stop in oh, Europe. Wow. Okay. But there it almost looks as if each talk represented a person or a period of time. Oh, cool. I'm almost wondering if they identify ancestry so that people would have had names for these because every single talk is different. There's not one that's the same as another. They might be slightly similar, but they're never the same. Okay. So I do wonder if they were something that was given or produced at a certain time in somebody's life or to identify something happening within a tribe. Okay. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't realise that they were also individual i thought that maybe there was oh that's amazing that's really interesting yeah there's there's a couple of very simple ones these kind of very simple where you've just got two bars that have been twisted together and then the ends have been looped Mm -hmm. um and they are literally just made out of wire Mm -hmm. thick wire you know rods Mm -hmm. um that are similar but even then you get a difference quite often in the way the wires have been twisted are they loose twisted or tight twisted the shape of the terminals. Mm -hmm. They really are very unique pieces. Okay. The the twisting is what is, what sort of connects them all as in. Yeah. And then you've got some that aren't, or you've got some that, um, yeah. And it is again, (laughs) what is a talk? Exactly. Well, that's what I'm curious. And indeed how, how one defines a talk then. Yeah. I think (laughs) it basically comes down to period, to be honest with you, Mm. because you've got things that people are wearing around their necks from very early on. I think we were going to talk about that later, Mm -hmm. but they are all made slightly differently. So you can get some that are literally two rods twisted together. You'll get some that are multiple rods twisted together. You'll get some where they've created these kind of springs 
of twisted wires that they then twist those together. That's like the great talk. Mm. There's a lot mm. of different technological skills and a lot of artistic showing off. Mm. And I think that's what it is. I think it is craftspeople and there is no reason this was men. It's a very important point to make. It's as likely to have been women hmm. who are almost showing off what they can do and trying out new things to make each talk something special. Oh, fascinating. Oh, yeah. So I'll, okay. I'll, I'll save, I'll save my first yeah. question for later because otherwise I'll go into this <laughs> section will be 40 minutes long. Yeah. So the, the final question we had was how do you wear a talk? Well, yeah. I mean, as I say, the ones with the gap in uh, the thing that most people ask us the whole time is, oh, my goodness, how would you get that on the neck? Because the gap between the terminals is really small. Mm -hmm. But actually, most of them, it's about three inches, something like that gap. Mm -hmm. And if you actually feel your neck, I'm imagining all of these people feeling their neck. (laughs) The amount that is actually solid in your neck is quite small. And if you actually pull on something that's got a three inch gap, it it will go around your neck quite easily. You don't actually have to bend it or manipulate it too much. Mm -hmm. The other thing about these talks, which no one realizes is they're really springy. Because of course, no one gets to pick them up. We all see them in cases and they look very solid. But the Mm -hmm. ones with the multiple wire springs like the Snesham Great Talk or the Newark Talk, when you lift them up, they, the terminals want to bang together oh. and they are very, they're firm, but they have a lot of give in them. Interesting. So, I mean, there's all these theories. A lot of people have said about how you lift one torque terminal up to get it round your neck. Most of the time you really don't need to, and you're putting excessive pressure on it, which hmm. is never a good idea. You're going to start damaging things if you keep bending them out of shape. True. I had a very nice snake bracelet at some point, which <laughs> went on and it, and it was sort of supposed to be put on and off like that. So they kind of overlapped a little bit, but you sort of bent them yeah. slightly out of shape and then put them on. And indeed, eventually, after a while, it, the head fell off. Which, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the thing we did. We did some work down at the National Physical Laboratory where they have this ultra high high speed camera Mm -hmm. and we opened the newark talk literally by only about five millimeters and Mm -hmm. then let it close naturally while it was filmed okay and you look at where moves this this camera can pick up where moves on the talk and we were really surprised in that actually the back of the talk which is where everyone says oh they opened and closed them and the back eventually wore out and they broke Mm-hmm. That wasn't where the movement was occurring. The movement was occurring around the edges. Oh, okay. And then when you look at a lot of these talks that are broken, that everyone says, ah, these broke at the back because they were open and closed. Mm. Actually, when you look at them, most of them have been cut or oh. something else has gone on. Mm-hmm. So, again, that's another one of those kind of bits of law in inverted commas that we've managed to show probably isn't what was going on. Oh, interesting. But they would likely have been, at least all the pictures I've seen is that you have the, the if there is an opening or if there is a, something that's Yeah, you the have front. the opening at the front. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. interesting. So Because oh. obviously the terminals are the really decorated bit. Yeah, it seems to be most of the time indeed. Yeah, yeah. but on the, some of the European ones like Valdalgesheim or Erstfield, um, Valdalgesheim from Germany, Erstfield from Switzerland, they're actually kind of decorated on the back as well. Oh, okay. So... They may have been seen in the round, either on a person or again, like I say, maybe they are when they're not on a person, maybe they're being looked at somewhere. Mm, yeah. Or indeed, that could also tell us a little bit about the, the hair, you know, hair was... Well, yeah, exactly. One. Suggest oh. you have your hair up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise, oh, can you imagine, you have this bit, at least my hair is so thick and curly, you wear a talk, it'll be... Hidden. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Yeah, talk would disappear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Oh, no, fascinating. Okay, well, those were sort of Google's most searched questions. There was actually a surprisingly little about it. Those were the only ones that, that came up, really. So there were a lot about 
talks with Vikings uh, and things, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later because I was curious about that. But for now, that's that for Google's most search questions. We're going to have a very quick break and then we will be back soon. Everybody, Chris Webster here to talk about one of the latest supporters to the Archaeology Podcast Network, The Motley Fool. Now, I've been investing in the stock market through various applications for a few years now, and everybody who's listening to this can benefit from that sort of investment for the long-term financial planning. And also, I know the hosts of these podcasts can benefit because as archaeologists, like none of us get retirement, (laughs) we all have to kind of fend for ourselves. So investing in the stock market is a good idea, but not everybody can do it. And look, we get it. The market is complicated and confusing. And to many of us, it simply doesn't make sense. In fact, where do you even start? Take all of the guesswork out of it with the Motley Fool Stock Advisor. The Motley Fool has been around for over 25 years and has been spot on in recommending some of the world's most important companies before they hit the big time. I'm talking about Amazon, Tesla, Netflix, Starbucks, all before they exploded in value. With their easy to use and super informative service, Stock Advisor, you could join the ranks before they potentially find the next big thing. After all, their average stock recommendation is up over 400% as of April 10th, 2023. And no need to be intimidated by financial jargon or market complexities. As the name suggests, these guys don't take themselves too seriously. Now, finances, that's a different story. Their friendly and relaxed approach has helped over 700,000 people move closer to financial independence, all while beating the market and having fun. New members can access Stock Advisor for only $89 for their first year, a full $110 off the full list price. Don't sit on the sidelines and think about what could have happened. Visit fool.com slash APN to start your investing journey today. That's $110 discount off of $199 per year list price. Membership will renew annually at the then current list price. So again, check the link in the show notes of this episode. Welcome back. So now we know a little bit more about the sort of basic knowledge of talks, but perhaps Tess, you could tell us even more about it as you are an expert on the topic as <laughs> amongst many other topics, it sounds like. But uh, So we spoke about it a little bit um, briefly. You mentioned gold and silver, but so what kinds of material were talks made from? Was it always these precious metals? I mean, generally, gold, silver and bronze. But there are, there's a talk from Spettisbury down in Dorset on the south coast, which is actually iron. And there's one that came up from Northampton, Great Lawton, I think is the site, that was actually lead. Oh, wow. (laughs) And of course, all we have is the non-organics. So there's Mm. possibility, because a lot of the twists, Julia Farley has talked about this curator at the British Museum, are a lot of these twists based on fabric, on yarn, things like that. So are we missing, were there leather talks? I don't know. There is zero evidence. It might just be there. That's really interesting. Now I'm trying to think. (laughs) Oh, Yeah, because you have also those sort of twisted leather. Well, that's the sort of plaited leather yeah, exactly. They would they would be perfectly makeable out of leather, particularly mm. if you've got if you're stiffening your leather and these people know how to make saddles, they you know, they mm. know how to work different things. So it is possible. Okay. And uh, has do you know if any research has been <laughs> has been done no. on experimental stuff? No. Mm. I've never seen anything like that. And the problem that we have of course is these talks seem to be very symbolic. Mm-hmm. So, and they do just occur in hordes and the majority of hordes are found by metal detectors and things like that. So mm. <laughs> yeah. unless you could find some on a waterlogged site or nice anaerobic conditions, mm-hmm. I'm not sure we'd ever know. And indeed, so that was actually another question I had. So uh, from what I, from my very, very brief, shallow, quick looking up of talks, it, it seemed that indeed most of them had been found in hordes. So there hasn't been any kind of uh, found just in in general settlement types or anything, or just very rare. Uh, yeah, they haven't been. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> this That's is really this is the bane of my existence. That the majority, I think, we've got from this country, we have got about four hundred talks represented from the UK. Mm-hmm. Now, of those, about three hundred and actually be more than it be be about 450 from the whole of the UK. And of those, we've got about 300 represented from Snettisham. So that's not necessarily complete talks. That could be pieces of wire that we can identify as unique to a certain talk. Of the Snettisham 300, only about 60 of them are complete. 
Okay. And when you look at the rest of the country, we've only got about 90 talks represented outside of Snettisham and only about 30 of those are complete. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're very much skewed towards what's going on at Snettisham. Yeah. But unfortunately, Snettisham still hasn't been published. Um, it's due out <laughs> any time now. Ah. <laughs> but the majority of other talks that we've got are either antiquarian finds, so they were dug up 19th century, early 20th century, often by shepherd boys. Shepherd boys seem to be able to find talks better than anybody else. And unfortunately, a lot of them, they tended to keep the nice ones and the Mm. rest of the hoard went to goldsmiths to be melted down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other problem that we've got recently is that most of them are detected finds. And although some of the sites of detection have been examined, and with Blair Drummond actually in Scotland, we have actually got talks associated with a site, Fraser Hunter dug it, and there does seem to be a building that the hordes were associated with. Okay. Most of the time, we, we, don't, we have no other contextual information. Okay. You get coins. So we've got coins at Snettersham, but of course all of those are deposition dates rather than making dates. Mm. And we know that these talks are hanging around sometimes for a couple of hundred years before they go in the ground. So it is very tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Probably just quickly for those who are listening in who don't know what a hoard is perhaps you could just <laughs> find a yeah i mean it's t- the traditional view I, sh- I probably shouldn't use the word hoard i should probably talk about deposition because hoard is a very loaded term ah. but traditionally hordes were always seen as it, you know in the days of invasion and everything being seen as invasion and trouble and blah blah, blah blah hordes were very much seen as the panicking locals burying all their goodies before running away and then being murdered and never coming back to collect them. Mm -hmm. Whereas nowadays we tend to understand that although there are a few hordes that are like that, the majority of hordes seem to be kind of, I'm going to use the word, ritual. Uh. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have a problem with ritual. The way you get dressed in the morning is ritual. You know, we put our socks on first or or whatever else. (laughs) But they are definitely associated with ceremony, with, with things that we can't explain readily. They they don't have a practical, inverted commas, mm-hmm. purpose. Mm-hmm. And in the case of talks, as I say, Snettisham is this ridiculous anomaly of a huge number of talks, which all went in mm-hmm. the ground, we think, very, very rapidly, potentially within a couple of weeks even. Okay. If you want to know more about this, there's a lot. We have a website called The Big Book of Talks and you can go and read everything's open access on there and you can go and read all about it. It's perfect. I'll provide the link in there. (laughs) (laughs) Anyone who wants to read. But um, outside of Snettisham, the normal picture is kind of three or four talks being buried in a discreet little group. They're usually away from settlements. They're quite often on raised ground or slopes. Yeah, it's... (sighs) offerings i think Mm -hmm. okay yeah my feeling is a lot of them are to do with offerings against the romans coming it's almost like the the talk is so symbolic of the iron age Mm -hmm. and do you know i mean obviously i know you focus more on on uk british talks or or that the those aspects but do you know if it's similar in other are talks found in other in other places for example yeah they are they (sighs) I mean, all across Europe, you find talks of some form or another. Mm -hmm. The UK, we seem to like them a lot more. But on the other hand, we also have a lot more detecting going on. So there is recovery bias going on. Mm, Particularly in the UK, we have forms that are very specific to here. So the kind of ring terminal talks, which can either be just simple rings or these big expanded kind of donut shapes like the Great Talk. Mm, they are very british very uk whereas if you look in france and germany they tend to do different things like i say you have the kind of complete circle or you have different designs i mean in spain in iberia they have these almost kind of teardrop shaped terminals or these strange kind of apple core Mm. shapes but again, yeah. a similar theme, you know, mm-hmm. two terminals on something. 
Mm-hmm. But the specific design of it seems to be quite unique to whichever area of Europe you're in. Oh, interesting. That's good to know. Um, it's but- like all things Iron Age. They kind of have a general theme. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then regionally and locally, they go off and do their own thing. <laughs> yeah, no, which I mean, I guess similar today as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> in those respects. And do you know if they're also found in, in hordes or in, shall we say, ritual uh, deposition? No, there are hordes, definitely. Okay, yeah. I mean, the, things like the Catillon horde, with that huge number of coins from Germany, also has a lot of talks. There's the Erstfield Horde, the Valdalgesheim. Yeah, similar themes again, but Mm -hmm. not necessarily the same reasons, I don't think. Okay. That's so fascinating, though, because it's, I I mean, I'm sure there are plenty, but just uh, that's the first time I'm hearing of an artifact that has only been found in these kind of depositions because generally it's sort of oh they're mainly found but then you have a few scattered here or you know it's half and half or something so that is very yeah and also Europe they have the tradition of because earlier they tend to put talks in graves so like the Vix mm-hmm. talk which if you look it up is absolutely one of the most stunning pieces of gold work mm-hmm. and that's actually within a grave whereas over here we de- they never put them in graves it just mm-hmm. doesn't happen Okay. So it's almost like you've, again, you've got changing traditions going on. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating, but I just wish we could find some talks with some really solid dating evidence that would help me immensely. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Which, because indeed it seems you sort of mentioning Iron Age and from what I've seen in sort of popular culture, talks are generally associated with the sort of Celtic Yes. I hate to use yeah. that, for, that word, but uh, Celtic cultures, shall we say. Yeah. And that's sort of, you would agree with that uh, situation because I... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've got the complication that, of course, we have the Romans over here in the UK, but in places like Scandinavia, they don't. So the, mm. the long Iron Age, <laughs> yeah. what would we would be talking about early medieval, they're still talking about Iron Age. So it's all a bit... Oh, dates. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Because indeed, what I, another question I wanted to ask, because when I was looking it up, like I said, a lot of things came up about Viking talks. And yes. I feel like indeed, when you look up replicas of things to get, I quite enjoy gathering replicas. So I have one, one of the Apple Call ones from the Iberian uh, Peninsula. Yeah. But, uh, there were a lot of Viking references made. Yes. So it's, uh, yes. not There's a... lots of things with wolves as terminals. And, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm many. not sure those but were is that... ever Viking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they have, they definitely have neck rings. Obviously, this isn't my period so much. So, you know, mm. but from what I've seen, I've been doing a bit of research on various things recently. They're more to do with bullion and things like that, that the Vikings have this whole thing of giving rings. And these rings are these kind of neck rings and arm rings, mm-hmm. which are very controlled weights. Mm hmm. But yeah, there's an interesting bit of research. I can't say anything about it now, but watch this space in a couple of months because interesting. it could get fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a funny story. That was one of the reasons that I first got into artifact analysis as a specialization was because I w- did a, a Viking archaeology course at Aberdeen Uni, my undergraduate yes. alma mater with Karen Millick. And uh, we were talking about these this uh, what were they called silver uh, yeah silver bullion i guess which is is just yeah. like yeah a ring with lots of other bits of silver attached to it that seemingly the objects themselves aren't what's important it's the weight of the silver and i found that so fascinating so that's what uh, yeah and also now they're starting to recognize as well as i say i've been reading a lot about this because it was always assumed it was silver whereas they're now recognizing that actually the vikings were using gold as well oh. and they seem to be treating it similarly and differently. So although it had a kind of bullion wealth, mm-hmm. it may also have had an artistic creative value as well. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Oh, oh I look forward to hearing about but what like it I is. Say, watch this space. In yeah. A few yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll definitely have all your information in the show notes so people can keep checking yeah. up on you and see, <laughs> see what's coming out. Very curious. Interesting. And, but they do only then emerge because, I mean, you mentioned that there was one or two that were made from sort of iron, but the rest were from 
silver and gold. When, I mean, gosh, I should know this. I'm a prehistorian, but I never did metal. <laughs> when does that start to be used more regularly? Can you already see them in the Bronze Age sort of uh, emerging? Yeah, I mean, as Bronze Age, you've got... Because again, you've got these neck rings. So you've got lunula, those kind of crescent moon shaped flat mm-hmm. neck rings, breastplates, whatever ah, they are. Yes, the sort of that look like yeah. a collar almost. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then you also get the gorgets, which are more elaborate. But mm-hmm. you've also got within the Bronze Age, these kind of twisted. What they actually do is they get um, if you think of it in cross section, it looks like a cross piece of wire. Mm-hmm. And then if you twist that, you get these kind of flanged. It's very cleverly done. Oh. If you go and look up Bronze Age talk, and then they have these kind of very simple, long terminals. But some of these mm-hmm. can be over a metre long, and no one's quite sure, because they quite often oh, wow. coil them up for burial. Oh. Again, in hordes. Mm. How are they being worn? Because at over a metre long, they're too big for a neck. Yeah. Maybe they're to go around a stomach. I've seen people suggest they may be actually for pregnant women. Ah. Oh. Who God, that'll be uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we've we've got gold being used quite a lot, and it's very pure, very good quality stuff going right up to the late Bronze Age. But then there's kind of a gap, and it seems that I don't tend to believe this because at the moment, since we've been doing talks, every single find that comes up changes the picture. Ah, so uh-huh. just about every couple of years, it goes back 100 years as something else uh-huh. appears. <laughs> okay. The last time this happened was in 2016, where the Leakfrith Horde came up and suddenly the whole dating for talks went back 150 years. Okay. So it is possible it's, it's not a real gap. My feeling is the craft that they're showing suggests that they've been doing it for a bit longer, that when we see it, it's already a very well developed craft. Because mm. I indeed, I was going to ask. Because surely, yeah, whether whether you see, you know, random twisted bits of metal kind of in in earlier context, but I suppose they wouldn't necessarily have been identified as something to do with talks from from earlier. No, I mean, and there's all sorts of odd things. There's something called ribbon talks, which you get a very plain, simple form of in the Bronze Age, but then that reappears potentially from about 300 BC onwards as this very elaborate, but unless you look very carefully, they look quite similar. So have the people making the Iron Age ribbon talks seen the earlier ones? Because they all seem to be occurring in Scotland and Ireland and Wales. So yeah, is it a continuation that we haven't recognised the kind of middle bit yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No. Or is it that someone has gone back and found something or seen something and gone, ah, I know what I can do with that. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I guess that's also, it's something really interesting, the fact that you said they're sort of similar, it's similar enough, but slightly different styles, whether it was something that just kind of naturally yeah. happened, you know, everywhere. Yeah. Or I mean, we work with a lot of goldsmiths and mm-hmm. goldsmiths like to play around with ideas. And they would look at some person that at one in goldsmith's work and kind of take something from it and then make something of themselves about it. So it doesn't surprise, I mean, we forget, we think of people in the past as being these kind of, I don't know, nameless, faceless, characterless people. But craftspeople, I think, have always been craftspeople, you know, to, to develop these incredible skills and ideas and designs and creativity means you've got to we actually wrote a paper working with some goldsmiths and they were saying you need to be talking to people you need to be seeing other people's work you can't just do this in isolation Mm -hmm. so yeah I I like to think they're all kind of because I think it is a very skilled craft yeah, no, definitely. I mean, gosh, just looking at some of these pieces, I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> yeah, uh... I mean, we, we've worked with a team of about 10 goldsmiths and some of the goldsmiths we'd worked with are quite old now and they were trained under the apprentice system where they were using less machines, things were all being done by hand. And they looked at the talks and said, yeah, I could do that, wouldn't be a problem. Hmm. Some of the younger goldsmiths who hadn't had so much of the traditional training were saying, I don't know about that. Mm, There were some other people who said, no, I really, I really wouldn't feel confident about doing this. I mean, it really is a high end 
craft, you would have to know what you were doing. But of course, the other aspect of this is it's likely that they were starting training very, very early. Mm, okay. There's a wonderful image by Tom Bjorklund, who does those fantastic kind of portraits of people in prehistory. And it's of a woman who's working bronze. And around her are her little children. And I'm sure, I mean, my, my dad was an incredible craftsperson. He was a carpenter and used to make all kinds of things, guitars and whatever. And all the while I was little, I was kind of hanging around the garage when he was working. And it, it drip, drip, drips into mm-hmm. you. You, mm-hmm. you kind of start watching and learning and watching and learning. And it's not necessarily that you're being trained as such. But from a very young age, this was part of life, I'm sure. Hmm. And then as they get older and by six or seven, kids are quite capable of doing quite complex things. Mm -hmm. So potentially we've got people that are trained hugely longer than they are now. Yeah. But do you think indeed it was sort of like a a training you sort of specialised in making talks or was it uh, general jewelers or was it just everyone like anyone could twist some wires together like you said yeah I I mean it is very specialized and this is a problem as well because we tend to in archaeology talk about metal workers and metal work can involve so much that the skill of a blacksmith working iron is completely different the workshop is different you need fire you need noise you need big tools you don't actually need light because you need to be able to see the change in color of things. Mm. If you're talking about casting, so casting bronze and things like that, you're talking again, different skill set. Yeah. And then once you get onto bronze sheet work, where you're actually hammering things, you've got to know about the metal very specifically, how it's going to behave. It all starts to become different. And then gold is the extra step on from that. Mm-hmm then in the later period silver but we tend to lump metal workers in together but their skills and where they work and what we're going to see in the archaeological record is very very different I mean for gold my feeling is they probably were trained in working bronze sheet we have various similarities between thicknesses and things like thicknesses of the metal and things like that Mm -hmm. But I don't think there were that many goldsmiths around. I mean, there were a lot of bronze workers because if you're thinking about villages or communities, you've got tools, you've got axes, you've got all sorts of things, chisels, and they need sharpening, they need remaking, Mm. casting. That's a very local level. I'm sure every community had one. But with gold, there's not that much gold around. And learning to to work it the way they do, they have to have been working with it quite often, I think. Okay. So it really was a precious metal. <laughs> yeah. And I think also they are, because gold is about the one material that doesn't tarnish. It's very ductile. It does all kinds of weird things. It's like butter when you work it. It's, it's mm-hmm. beautiful material. And I think these guys would have been seen as separate or something special or... And also, who are they working for? Are you having people coming to them or are they traveling? Mm. Is the gold moving? Are the craftspeople moving? Again, all answers we, I think craftspeople are moving because I think then that fits in with the thing of them seeing lots of other people's work. Mm, Um, And that could well explain why in Europe we have kind of similar but different things going on. Yeah. Because there's sort of a limit to how far you will travel, maybe, but you travel enough to meet someone else who's travelled yeah, far. Yeah, and also it's... when you read, I mean, if you look at the account of Pythias or you look at what the Romans were up to once they come to the UK in 55 BC, they are constantly talking about travel. Hmm. You know, they are travelling backwards and forwards from Rome the whole time. They're, I mean, Pythias is off all over the place. <laughs> and I don't see there's any problem with goldsmiths doing that as well. Yeah, it would explain a lot of the things that are happening where you've got these kind of ideas being picked up in different places. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, that it's not necessarily men doing it. And you talked about the depiction of a woman working yeah. brands and her children there. So it, this is, I guess, also something we don't know. <laughs> is, is, uh... No, I mean, we, we work with female goldsmiths as well, who are as capable of making these. Mm-hmm. And my feeling is you've got, I mean, the apprenticeship systems in this country starts at about 1300, I think. Hmm. But there's always been 
ways of passing on craft Hmm. and that has to be shown you know you you can't kind of draw it or watch a video or whatever like we can do now you've got to actually sit with somebody who is making something who says right this is what you do no don't do it like that (laughs) and if we're thinking about that traditionally apprentices have gone from father to son or down the male line. Mm. But like I say, that the only records we've got are from about 1300 onwards, I think mm. 1100 onwards. But we do have female goldsmiths recorded in London in the early medieval period. And also, I mean, my, my family line is quite, <laughs> quite a, I'm kind of destined to do this because my family were all Huguenot goldsmiths. Oh, there you go. And it's came fate. over, yeah, I know, <laughs> came over in the early 1700s and then in a direct line from 1722, I think it is. And that's just as far as we know when they came over. They were probably doing this for years before in France. Direct line from that period to my great grandfather in 1936 and the line only broke because he died early all of them were goldsmiths father to son father to son father to son and diamond setters wow so that's kind of 300 years yeah i don't think it's inconceivable that in prehistory we were looking at a similar thing and it would have been within families or groups you know connected groups Mm. so the child would learn from the adult the logical thing of that is is potentially families families of goldsmiths in the same way that you have trades now or you had trades before yeah and if you've got that scenario if you had a girl I don't think you're gonna (laughs) yeah oh no you can't you can't make these (laughs) we finished now (laughs) yeah because it would effectively kill off your line yeah. if you do that. Huh. And you've got all these hundred years of experience and knowledge and because that's all held by people. It's not held in books at that point. Yes, true. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And like you say, it makes sense if you're just if that's what you see on a day to day Yeah. Know, from your father or mother or Yeah. yeah. And particularly also the association early on and then even in the later period because you know they talk about Boudicca wearing the gold necklace Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. is an association with women and gold yeah there's nothing to say that they were women but there is equally absolutely nothing to say that they weren't oh I think yes that's a good a good concluding sentence (laughs) (laughs) I think we're going to have another quick break now so that people listening can have an opportunity to top up their tea Uh, but we will be back soon what's the easiest choice you can make Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. So welcome back, everyone. I hope that the teacups are now full and the biscuit jar is emptier. And uh, Tess, of course, we did already introduce you in the first section of this episode very briefly, but uh, perhaps we can go into a little more detail now. So I think actually what we did is that you are an independent researcher as opposed to being sort of affiliated with a, a university or a museum. Was this always the case? I am. Yes, I guess yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure how I ended up there. You know, how do, how do any of us end up anywhere? But after I finished my PhD, when was that? Back in 2004, I then had my daughter in 2005. And I carried on working for the Prehistoric Society, which I think we'll talk about a bit later. And then when I started researching talks in the same way as when I'd started researching fortifications, it was just because I was enjoying it. Mm. And I was lucky enough to have the prehistoric society as an income 
and doing admin. So it was more, you know, not a lesser task, but I wasn't using my brain in the same way. So I could do research as well on top of that. Mm. And then I started thinking about kind of formalizing things and maybe going into academia, but then decided that actually it's quite nice staying as an independent researcher. And when I look at what so many of my lovely colleagues in the UK Mm -hmm. (laughs) are going through currently, solidarity to all of them. Mm. It just, yeah, it just seemed an easier way of doing things. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be quite strict with yourself. Definitely. I can imagine, (laughs) especially, I mean, I only did it very briefly and I'm not sure I'd really have classified myself as an independent researcher. It was more, I was trying to find a position and I couldn't. So I just kept going because I enjoyed it and uh, wasn't getting, unfortunately paid for anything, but it's, I can imagine you have the extra freedom and the flexibility, but I suppose the financial security, shall we say, is a little less yeah. than, than. Yeah. It. I mean, I'm the classic position of female archaeologists that, I mean, I'm divorced now, but it was my partner that was funding a lot of my lifestyle, you know, mm-hmm. as is so sadly the case for so many archaeologists, male and female, that a partner who's got a proper in inverted Job, <laughs> yes, ends up sorting out a lot of different things. I mean, I have luckily, I mean, I've always been self-employed because from being a prehistoric pottery specialist, working with the prehistoric society, picking up bits of research, actually paid research at things like the um, National Archives and the British Library. And now doing this, we kind of get the occasional paid lectures, bit of paid teaching, bits and bobs that you can then plow into the next museum visit you want to do things like that but yeah it's it's not a living <laughs> yeah. yeah unfortunately well because I get a lot of questions through my various channels asking you know how do you get into archaeology or like is archaeology a proper job <laughs> indeed um, yeah and uh, so I, I I thought it was really interesting indeed so far we've had on this show we've had sort of crafters but also academics and so I thought it was interesting to have someone who's doing the research, but from, yeah, an independent standpoint. So I was wondering if you could, yeah, perhaps elaborate a little on the the kind of advantages, the disadvantages, what, what advice you wish you had given yourself, shall we say, when you, when you first decided to go this way? Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky. Obviously I'm older. I'm, I'm 52 now. It makes life easier because you're more established. You know, my daughter's now 17. I don't have those issues to deal with. She's kind of her own independent person, really. And as I say, I've been lucky in that when I came through, you could get a job in archaeology. You know, I've never been unemployed. I've never earned a lot of money, but I've never been unemployed. Mm, The prehistoric society job is the kind of constant that has meant that my rent or my mortgage has always been paid. Mm -hmm. And as I say, you can pick up bits and pieces. In terms of academically, I'm lucky in that... Working for the Prehistoric Society gives me library access at UCL, Mm -hmm. which is the big thing that I I think most independent researchers struggle with because obviously paywalls and things like that, if you don't have library access. Mm -hmm. The way we've tried to do it, I firmly believe in open access 100%. So as we've talked about before, the Big Book of Talks, you will find everything on there. You don't have to pay for any of it. Perfect. We've tried to do at least one peer review paper a year so that that keeps us academically credible. Mm. But we also publish various bits and pieces on our website. We've also independently peer reviewed, um, had a marvellous friend who acted as editor in inverted commas and then found two peer reviewers in inverted commas oh, okay mm-hmm. and it was actually a superb process because both peer reviewers anonymized themselves very quickly and said if we're going to do this differently let's do it properly yeah and we had some wonderful conversations about the paper and the paper which is on the grotesque talk from snettisham was all the better for it yeah, yeah. but it is open access and it's up on our website and anybody can download it and read it and I mean, that is, that's all the peer review is, right? Is, is exactly. These people, people were peer it. reviewing for journals. It's not that they're not yeah. qualified to be peer reviewers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have fundamental issues about a lot of the way we do academia mm-hmm. because I'm seeing more and more there are people who, it depends how high you are up the tree a lot of the time. 
you know, we've we've had papers in PPS, but mm. a lot of that's to do with the fact I've got doctor in front of my name. Mm. I'm known within the community. Had I been an independent reviewer with uh, an independent researcher with no background in inverted commas, mm. would we have been able to do what we do? I don't know. Yeah. And I think that's quite sad. And indeed, a lot of the, the at least so I recently finished my, well, almost finished my PhD, so I need to defend, but I did an article-based one. So you had to publish um, yeah, four yeah. to five academic articles. And a lot of them were open access, which was great, and also uh, free to publish. Um, so you didn't have to pay yeah. anything to actually publish it, which I was very appreciative of and didn't realize that that's not the norm until I then did the last two papers. And both of them, I had to pay to publish a ridiculous amount of money, yeah. but also pay to make it open access. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, full dis- full disclosure, I'll say the amount. I had to pay $2,000 to publish a 36-page paper, and then you have to pay the same amount on top of that, which I think a lot of people don't realize no. when when they're complaining that things aren't open access as well. But also that is a really bad thing. I, yeah. I, well, anyway, I won't and mention also which image was, rights. But... I mean, any artifact yeah. person yeah. who is publishing an artifact-based paper will tell you image rights kill yeah. more things than anything else. Yeah. I mean, that was part of the reason that we set up the Big Book of Talks, because we wanted to show, particularly as the research we were doing initially was kind of seemed to be controversial Mm -hmm. because it disproved a lot of previous research that had been done. Excellent. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We wanted to show exactly why we were saying what we were saying. And the only way you can do that with artifacts is with images. Yes. And drawn images, okay, fine, they can show and they are wonderful, but you can always slightly adapt to draw an image exactly. to make it look what you show. Yeah, and especially if it's there's controversial a anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for that grotesque talk paper that we produced, I think it's got 40 images in it. Now, all of those are the British Museum. All of those would have been at least £90 each. Yes. No. By the time you've got 40 images, you are looking at an awful lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> Or, again, journal publications, you can't have that number of images. Yes, yeah, a lot of time. Or they have to be in black and white or... The, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've found it's really useful. I don't know. We've yet to see... I don't think we've been doing this long enough. We are starting to get cited now in various different things. Mm-hmm. But it'd be interesting to see whether people start citing. I know we're on various university reading lists, the website is. Oh, but okay. it will be interesting to see whether the website articles start getting cited. I suspect they won't because they're not officially peer reviewed. Mm, Yeah. But in a way I don't care. I don't, I don't have a career to forge. I would rather get the information out there. And if we get the information out there, people can judge whether we're telling the truth or not. Yeah. Have we provided the evidence? So that's kind of the level of I'm at. I've suddenly realized in my older years that we forget about the true meaning of education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to educate people in the in the widest sense, whoever they are, wherever they come from. And yes. I don't think the traditional models of academia necessarily fit that. I, I could not agree more. I mean, and yeah. that's one of the main reasons I started this podcast, to be honest. Well, exactly. I, I mean, we do we do all sorts of things. I mean, you know, I have a big Twitter following where I mm. share information. We do blogs. We do things for the... We've done magazines, the British Archaeology, the CBA magazine, mm-hmm. you know, videos, lectures, all kinds of stuff. It's all on our website. And hopefully there will be something for everyone, be they the kind of diehard academics who want mm-hmm. the absolute evidence yeah. or members of the public who just want to know about shiny things. Yeah. Well, but and it's great that uh, because I think a lot of the time, you know, if I'm looking up things, just small things for the for these podcasts or for the little reels I do on Instagram or something, I want to make sure that I have the correct information. And yeah. a lot of the time then I do look at papers because I think, OK, well, these are academic peer reviewed papers. But then yeah. it's great when you do find a resource like this that is provided by people who you know are researchers you know yeah. like you say they don't have yeah, to be yeah. affiliated with the museum but it's sort of a difference between someone who's a you know slight potential 
potential pseudo archaeologists. Yeah, exactly. I watched a couple of videos on exactly. YouTube versus <laughs> yeah. I have actually got the evidence and here it is. So you can interrogate it yourself. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah I think that that's a, a fantastic resource. I'll definitely be putting the link to all of this in the, in the show you. notes. So hopefully, and hopefully there's people wonderful, will see. I, I added last year a further reading page. So there is literally oh, just a page of references Great for anyone resources. who wants to read about talks. Perfect. Oh, that sounds good. And you mentioned already uh, the Prehistoric Society, of course, and I think that uh, a lot of people, both even within academia, but also outside of academia, they know that these societies exist. But what are these societies, I guess? Yes, and, yeah. and why, why should people join them? And uh, what, what's the, yeah. What, yes, what? yes. I'm the membership secretary for the Prehistoric Society and I have been for 28 years. So mm-hmm. if I don't know about the Prehistoric Society. Yeah, basically, fundamentally, we are a learned society. So we produce a journal, the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society. But we also do a lot of other things besides. So we have a newsletter that comes out three times a year. We run a lot of events, lectures, conferences. We also on our website have educational resources, which will fit in with the England and Wales national curriculum. But we've also got things that can be used for home learning. They can be used for adult learners. We've got signposts, A4 downloads for sites that you can go and visit around the country. We do a lot of different things. We obviously have an active social media presence. A lot of our lectures now are online because we realised how wonderful the possibilities of Zoom were. Yes. <laughs> and we found it's it's been so nice because there's so many people we've managed to connect with who either have caring responsibilities, access issues, financial issues and they can watch things online for free Mm -hmm. from all over the world as well Mm. so yes we we do a lot and I'm very proud of the prehistoric society because we are constantly moving forward Mm. and do you have to be affiliated with anything in order to join do you have to be an archaeologist (laughs) okay nope anybody can join at all We have, obviously, that's the other beauty of this, because we have most of the professional prehistorians in the world as members, but we also have amateur archaeologists, we have students, we have people who have just got an interest in prehistory, and we're trying providing something for all of them. Hmm. But if you come to our lectures, you will see, we, you know, we, we do have, because we were founded in 1935, hmm. we are the leading organisation for prehistory. And it means we can phone people up and say, we would like a lecture on this, or we would like you to do this, that and the other. Yeah. So well worth it. Yeah, and it is yeah. not expensive either. It is not. I can confirm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> can which if you're an individual ordinary member, it's £45. But if you're retired, it's £35. And if you're a student, it's only £20. And that will give you all of our publications, access to lectures. We also provide grants, various different grants for students, research projects, yes. museum collections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And all of that includes postage and packing anywhere in the world. So there you go. <laughs> yes, I, I was lot. lucky enough to get the I was lucky enough to get the the, the research fund uh, yes. back when I was uh, in well, in between studentships. <laughs> so it was yes. I was I was still technically a student, but I didn't have a job yet. Yes. And again, that's <laughs> that's another possibility for independent researchers you yeah you have to be a member of the society to apply but you don't have to be in an institution um, yeah. or anything else if you can make the case we will fund you yeah which i think a lot of people i i know that a lot of for example certainly my friends of, of my kind of age and i mean i've just finished the phd and i did the kind of classic you yeah. know undergrad masters phd works a little bit in commercial but uh, now i'm sort of going i think a little more outside ac- academia and there's a lot of people i know who wanted to continue in academia but just indeed can't find yeah. the job and so i think it's really great that there's still these communities that you can have because i mean to me at least that was one of the main pros of working in academia was that you have this network but i think yeah. that it's nice that there's these societies that still give you that network uh, outside. Yeah, and I think people are realising now, I mean, the number of very successful, very well-researched books coming out, things like Becky Rag Sykes, Kindred, yes. Kat yeah. Jarman's River Kings. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I think people are seeing that academia is not the only way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
No, definitely. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> which I'm very happy for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, as a final thing, because this was actually something that <laughs> always pops up whenever I Google you. It's your, yeah. um, so, and I remember seeing them and going, no, surely they're not, surely they're not chocolate. So <laughs> apparently you make chocolate artifacts. <laughs> I do make chocolate artifacts, yes. And it's the one thing I'll be at a conference and obviously I have quite a distinctive name. And I'll suddenly notice someone reading my name badge and then the eyes come up and it's like, you're the one who makes it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm the one who makes the chocolate artifacts. Yeah. I, um, I'm not entirely. Well, what it was that Roland and I, who I work with looking at at talks, there's various schemes because at some point we want to make a talk. A okay. replica one because Roland is a, I should say, is a museum standard replica maker and he makes all kinds of gorgeous things. Oh, beautiful. And we were talking about how we would get them at, because this is how we got into talks was <laughs> <laughs> talking about how they were made and him saying, I don't think they're made the way they say they are, and me saying, Oh, really? And then going off and doing research and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but one of the ideas that we had of how we were going to raise money to make a talk. Roll suddenly said, I know, we'll make chocolate talks and sell them in the museum and then we can make some money. And it's like, okay, so could you do this? And it was like, I don't know. I've got no background in this whatsoever. (laughs) And it was thanks to, I made a silly kind of wax copy of a terminal just when I was fiddling about at one point and then realized you can buy this food grade silicon molding putty, Uh which basically creates molds like those, um, ice cube trays that you get. And yes, sort of yeah. So I covered this wax mold in this silicon putty, cut it all off, stuck it back together again and poured chocolate in it. And ta-da, I had a talk terminal. Amazing. In chocolate. <laughs> and then it was kind of like, well, it's chocolate. I need to make it look more like, and then discovered the wonderful world that is cake making ingredients where mm-hmm. you can buy all sorts of paints that are all <laughs> edible and gold sprays and goodness knows what else. Uh-huh. And then from there, it kind of became a bit of a challenge that once I'd made one thing, obviously, Roll being a replica maker had a lot of things that I could cover in this silicon <laughs> moulding putty. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and the only rules have ever been there's no internal scaffolding and it's got to be 100% edible. So all of the paint and everything, the chocolate. And then you start getting things like, oh, there's an antler comb, a Viking antler comb. That's very thin. Could I do that? And so you try it and yeah, okay. So most things I've only made once or twice. Yeah, and it's very much a hobby. And usually by the time I finish making something, I'm absolutely sick of chocolate because various people have said to me, oh, you should do it commercially. It's like, no, no, (laughs) destroy it absolutely destroy it but it's certainly a talking point and also again I know it sounds daft but another educational thing definitely there's a lot of people who will kind of come for the chocolate and stay for the (laughs) yeah talk about talks yeah. (laughs) yeah no absolutely well and I mean I can imagine also it it does you 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 yourself will probably get more of an insight into different aspects of the artifacts as well if you're having yeah it's really interesting actually because the netherer terminal which is this little gold detached terminal that i made in chocolate originally they were saying that these talks were cast so you know molded effectively like i was doing in chocolate and i could never get it to work properly in chocolate it kept having Mm. bubbles in certain places and sure enough (laughs) these talks weren't actually cast and made of sheet gold (laughs) so it's a research method it (laughs) is and there's various things when i've been making them that i've said to roll when i've made a chocolate one and oh that was a real problem Hmm. and he'll go yeah i had that problem when i was casting it because this bit's too thin or this bit's too you know so you do it bizarrely it it is actually relevant (laughs) no i just i know it's not as necessarily related to the rest of this episode but i just thought it was too interesting a hobby but yes it's yeah it's um yeah as i say it's definitely the thing at conferences that you get remembered for (laughs) well like you say it's a it's a I, a form of outreach in itself as well, right? It is, sort of more it is definitely. And definitely there have been times with people where, I mean, the actual, the netherer 
terminal that I've got because we were lucky to be able to mold off a plaster cast copy of the terminal. So I actually have an exact copy in oh, chocolate. <laughs> And that one, you know, you give lectures and you talk about it and it immediately breaks the ice. Yeah. If I'm ever a bit panicky about talking about something contentious, you kind of go, here's a chocolate talk and people laugh and it's fine. <laughs> it's all okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can do this now. Don't rip me to shreds. I made you chocolate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> No, but no, a very interesting hobby. And it makes me want to try and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, literally, if you can get, unfortunately, the food grade stuff that I used to use, they've just stopped making. Oh, no. So I'm not sure because I've tried various other ones and it doesn't work in the same way. But yeah, the basic principle is if you can cover it in silicon molding putty yeah. and manage to get it off, that's half the challenge oh, is. Yeah. Then taking yeah, off the mould mm. so that you can put it back together again. Yeah. And then just fill it with chocolate and you'll be amazed. It's not that difficult. People seem to think, oh, my goodness, this woman has some amazing artistic talent. <laughs> well, no, you need, you need to keep that going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut that bit. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you have a go. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got a lot of replicas here. So now I'm looking at them all going, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> the other thing that's wonderful is if you can get the kind of the ice cube trays and there's various things now for resin molding mm, that you can yeah. get. All yeah. of those would work in chocolate and just oh. have fun. I used to just make tiles, little square tiles of chocolate and then people would paint them like medieval tiles and things like that. It's lovely. Someone does that. I'm trying to remember who it is. Someone does biscuits and yes. she makes them. Oh, they I are. I can't remember what her name is. Exquisite. They're yes. beautifully I exactly created. And I think she creates them for museums sometimes as well. Yes. And- yeah, and they're all hand painted. I mean, yes. they are stunning. Very now beautiful. I know exactly who you mean. They're very beautiful. That um, is true talent. <laughs> well, so is it. Yours, your pieces look fantastic. I remember you sharing some pictures of me going, "That's not chocolate." And then I was going, "Oh wait, it is." Wow. Yeah, I actually <laughs> once I had um, an Armorican axe that I'd made for a friend, and we were at a conference. And I gave it to her and I got it all wrapped up in greaseproof paper and I gave it to her. And she was just, oh, my goodness. She trotted over to show a curator, a prehistoric curator. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's an axe. So what? No, no, no. Look. Look at it. It's an axe. So what? No, smell it. (laughs) (laughs) So it it totally fooled a curator. Uh, Excellent. That's the that's the test. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Great. Well, um, I think that marks the end of our tea break today. Uh, Sounds like you've got a lot of exciting secret projects to uh, be getting on with. So uh, I look forward to hearing about them. But thank you so much for joining me today, Tess, and sharing about talks, but also about your your experience as an independent researcher. I very much appreciate you uh taking the time today well thank you for having me it's been great yeah and uh, if anyone wants to find out more about tess's work of course we'll be sharing the link to the great book of uh, talks and check the show notes on the podcast homepage. i'll try to share as many things as possible for the prehistoric society etc as well so hope that everyone enjoyed our journey today See you next month for another episode of Tea Break Time Travel. I hope that you enjoyed our journey today. If you did, make sure to like, follow, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll see you next month for another episode of Tea Break Time Travel. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.